good to go yeah excellent okay um good um uh, good evening everyone uh, my name is chetan chetan kumar baliga uh, it's a delight uh, to be with you uh, today uh, i am an agile delivery practitioner uh, leading uh, and also leading agile delivery transformations for a while now i i have uh, 22 years of experience in the industry um we have we have a distinguished personality uh, in the world of agile delivery with us this evening uh, she she is the author of a popular book uh, um <clears throat> being agile in business that's the name of the book she is also the founder of a company that goes by the same name you know being agile that specializes in helping teams and organizations in their agility journeys uh, she has close to 30 years of experience in the industry uh without so without further ado on behalf of all of you i welcome belinda waldock welcome belinda good evening and thank you for this wonderful opportunity oh thank you that was such a lovely intro i always kind of go a bit kind of glee uh, like um oh i don't know what the, the expression is but yeah it's always like just um nice um makes me feel good <laughs> so, so thank you i shall i i might be just if my eyes get diverted it's just where i'm i'm adding people into the call as they're dropping in so that's great and um yeah it's, it's really lovely to be here so um just to 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 give some background actually we um connected um via linkedin um chatting about the fact that my business was 7 years old um and some of my things were getting older and you just said 30 years which made me feel really old <laughs> but 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 true and i i often say that actually my my agile journey started when i i i started riding horses because um you know you have to be very agile to to be in that sport and there's a lot of failure and a lot of falling um going on when you're learning that so um Yes but yeah I've been um I've been being agile I think a long time now um and um yeah so part of that was to kind of say let's run some sessions let's do some stuff to celebrate that and um that's resulted in this session and um I I recognized a couple of names who um submitted some questions onto LinkedIn um which was great and so we're running through those this evening this afternoon depending on your time zone um and um just giving some just going to kind of keep it conversational i think i've got a few slides to remind us of the questions um and um i'll pop those up quickly actually just so we can go but i will come back to screen because it's always nice to just be able to see faces i think um so we we um named well um uh chaitan named the the talk actually he came up with a suggestion of yeah, the agile road less traveled and i absolutely love um the poem and the book um if you know it um and so and i thought it was really appropriate because i think um in terms of agile journeys i think you probably say i am somebody who has taken a, a road less traveled if you like um so i'm 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 more about that kind of being agile rather than doing agile um i'm i you know i'm more about the being agile i don't really mind which tools and practices and methods and frameworks that you're following if it gives that agility if it gives that feeling um and and that um and that result so uh, so i think i've got a little bit of housekeeping do connect with me if we're not connected because it's always great to connect um we've got 90 minutes um we're going we are recording um and i'm um i think what would be really great is if you've got kind of thoughts as we go through so if you'd like to add into the conversation add in um is we can use chat for that so if you've got thoughts do add them through the chat um as i say a couple of people on video is always lovely because it gives me a face to talk to and a bit of a reaction to to what we're saying um and um i'm i i think we'll probably have a little break halfway through as well just so we can just grab a breather for 5 minutes um so hopefully that all makes sense and um oh, i think that somebody just a uh, couple more let me admit those guys in okay. um 
so one of the questions I wanted to ask actually just to get a feel for who's in the room was um and it and it's just a kind of a, a simple and, and a small kind of question really is if you were to um scale yourself on a one to ten in terms of how you feel about kind of your um your agility if you like how agile do you feel um so a, a one would be I'm just kind of starting out I don't I don't feel very agile at all whereas a 10 would be you know I've been doing this for years I, I live and breathe agile um so just I'm curious really you don't have to respond but if you're if you're um if you're up for it then I'd love to just pop in a number into chat and um let me know where you are it just gives me a better idea of who I'm talking to in that sense of how much experience and um, we've probably got a mix, I imagine. Um, so I'm probably going to talk like I've got a mix, um, but it's just always nice to get a sense of who's in the room. So, oh, we've got middle of the ground, say four to five and five. So that's a nice, yeah. So that's um, um, some point. Oh, I like that. I like that. I like the accuracy of the, um, how I'm feeling on that scale. It's, um, that is great. So, um, and I think I, I, oh gosh, I mustn't get carried away with things, but actually a six or seven is a really lovely place to be because actually a nine and a 10 often is maxing out and we'll find that other areas will, will suffer almost because we're, we're running a 10 out of 10 in one area. We can't then sustain 10 out of 10 across the board. So, um, oh, brilliant. Lots of fives and sixes and sevens coming through. So there's some nice synergy there. So, um, oh, we've got a nice, nice mix in the room. So that's great. Thank you for that. That's that's great. Um, I I thought it would be appropriate to put the poem up just to to remind you. I'm very tempted to read it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna resist. Um, and also the book. I think if you if you haven't read them, um, then they are um they are great to read. I think a lot of us did it in English in our um. And and um, it's a it's a well known poem, um, but I I love the poem in the sense that it is all about kind of decision making. I think it is about being agile in so many ways. That benefit of hindsight, how things look different, you know, when we take a decision versus how they look in hindsight, and how agile is all about really um, harnessing that and taking that iterative approach so we're building in that reflection regularly we're able to look back and reflect and check our path and pivot pivot or persevere and really helping us with you know some of the essence that is is behind this poem and, and behind the book as well um so it's um it's a very i think appropriate appropriate title which is great so right without further ado and um i think we've probably got the um I think most of us are here so um I shall stop talking poetry and start talking agile although as I say I do think there's there's beautiful synergy between the two um uh, Chetan as our um host so the way we'll do this I think is um Chetan's going to ask the questions as such and give a few thoughts for himself and then I'm going to add to that as well and as I say if you've got chat if you want if you've got things that you want to add do add them in the chat and what I'll do is I'll I'll go through that transcript afterwards and we can we can share that where it's where it's really useful so right right, right. okay yeah thanks uh, Belinda um, <clears throat> so the first topic uh, for uh, this evening is uh, about uh, the various aspects of a team in agile delivery uh, and uh, the first question within that uh, uh, was uh, how to keep the team's tempo consistent with the values and delivery, while a good scrum team will tend to improve uh, uh, tend to improve iteration after iteration. Team members will carry an unknown risk, which is which is fatigue. How to minimize this risk so that team members are in a good space or a happy space to deliver value consistently? That's the first question under uh, the aspects of a team in agile delivery. So, uh, should I be sharing some thoughts, uh, Belinda? Yeah, last you you made. Um, I mean, we both actually last night spoke about this just sustainable pace, didn't we? We we talked about this idea of um, of sustainable pace. Yeah. So, so say what you were. Yeah. 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 
you want to? Yeah, or or I'll carry yeah. on. But I, yeah, you, I, mean, you, yeah, were, yeah. Um, right, I think you should start. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll um, uh, <laughs> we'll get into our flow in a second, won't we? The first question, and then we'll we'll be on our flow. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, we we had a quick a quick pre call call last night, um, and um, just had a really good conversation about building this sustainable pace within a team. Um, and I think tempo often kind of sounds like it's a continuous kind of consistent and there's there's a part of me that feels that actually you know a team's got a bit more of a heartbeat and actually sometimes we're you know really productive we're really doing things well things are going great and they're all falling into place and then other times things are really hard and difficult and challenging and the customers changing their mind a lot and all these different things and so I think actually thinking of us as having this you know flat you know consistent delivery is is actually unrealistic a lot of the time and actually we need to create this sustainable pace and this this the slack and the the space for the team and i think there's so much um emphasis on you know at the end of the sprint we must deliver something but actually we should put equal emphasis on our reflection and our ability to pause each sprint you know so it's not one big long marathon that we've got to keep going those sprints are giving us that time to stop and catch our breath and see where we are and you know and then recharge if you like and and go again so I think if we're we're, we're following those patterns then we should you know hopefully manage that fatigue but keep an eye out for it because there are you know early signs that we can use I it, it, it's interesting how many teams I meet that almost put themselves into perpetual failure you know they they give themselves too much to do in a sprint they can't get it done you know and and it be just becomes this loop of perpetual failure and it kills morale it's awful and actually having that slack you know getting that stuff done and then being able to do more is a much more positive kind of solutions focused way of doing it which i think is good do you agree Right, right. I, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, good points uh, you have uh, um, you have come up with and presented. And I think most of the audience here would uh, resonate with those points in one way or the other. And uh, what I would like to add is, uh, I mean, I think the idea is to build a, uh, I mean, obviously, not every time we would have the flexibility to have a mature team when we start, right? So start with a good team. Right. And again, uh, when we say good team, uh, right, for, for usually, I mean, in the past, a good team would be a team having uh, you know, a lot of specialists, uh, a team that would work over time or a team that would know, uh, try and say yes to most of the things. Uh, um, but I think over a period of time, uh, what we what we have learned or what we should realize is a good team also means you know, a team that can have the right mindset, right? A team that is quite energetic and it possesses a good mix of uh, you know, skills. I mean, moving from specialist to being T-shaped, right? And also having, uh, you know, showing some kind of flexibility and also having the courage to ask questions and and you know, uh, uh, be uh, be able to cordially disagree also, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that they have to say yes all the time. Though that is where, uh, I mean, healthy disagreements can, I mean, healthy disagreements can lead to uh, uh, stronger solutions, right? So that's uh, so a healthy mix of uh, you know, these points and the, and the ones that you mentioned right in terms of having a slack you know in, in introducing some spikes and doing required brainstorming whenever required and also you no know, kind of being in a rotation so that the same person doesn't do the same job every iteration or every sprint and then you know, um, also trying to you know, include include some fun elements within work and it's not always about uh, you know, um, i mean Come Friday, we have a release. It's not about that, right? So a healthy mix of all these. And I think uh, um, obviously the fatigue factor will be there, but I think that is how we are going to deal with it so that every time the team comes back, right, they feel a bit more energized and they can maintain their morale that way. Yeah. I th one of the things that you just made me think about when you were talking there as well is that how I think one of the beauties of Agile is it whatever methodology you're using it is literally putting the writing on the wall. So, you know, if you're listening to that that board, what the board is showing, the blocks, the impediments, if, you know, things aren't getting done, 
then you know i'm a great believer i'm a i'm a theory why kind of person people are doing the best they can with the resources the tools um and the skills that they've got and so you know if there is if there are challenges within the team then it will be the skills the resources the environment that they're in that needs to improve in order to let them to be able to do their job effectively you know i think that's what often causes fatigue is um you know not having that environment that we need and then um and you know it's in the principles you know give your team the the environment the support the skills that they need and trust them to get the job done it's um so yeah great i think that's um, right. gosh i think i think all of these questions we could spend the entire 90 minutes on couldn't we ooh, is ooh, there um, yeah, i'll yeah. just i'll have a quick look at chat i'm going to try and um have a quick um so i think there's some agreement there so that's great and um so shall we shall we swiftly um have a look at the next one so there's a couple of um i've broken these right down now um <coughs> excuse me i like this picture yeah so this is the um the, the the second um the question was around the practical challenges faced by the team on a day-to-day -day basis you had some good thoughts on this um Nate, then you, you you they came they right. came quite quite well to you last night so i think um, uh, over a period of time when i have uh, you know, uh, spoken to teams and also while i have been a part of various teams right um, uh, some of the co very common uh, challenges, I mean, of course, there will be you know, um, tens of challenges, but the ones that uh, are strikingly similar across teams, right, or most of the teams have highlighted, would, one would be um, um, kind of sticking to a time box. Um, I mean, what we call as the time box challenge, right, as especially when they do scrum and scrum events, time box becomes uh, you know, uh, of some importance. And then also uh, the span of attention, right? Because uh, um, uh, too big an iteration or too uh, complex a requirement or too, uh, you know, too lengthy meetings, uh, people tend to you know, um, lose focus. So span of attention was also something that they were trying to deal with. And then uh, the other, um, um, I mean, a topic that is probably being beaten to death, uh, right, is context switching or what are the... Um, disadvantages of context switching i mean while while at the outset it, it looks like it is uh, good but what uh, what are the drawbacks that come along with context switching plus uh, um, uh, i mean in in the 21st century well, uh, what happens with the lack of t shaped skills um, and uh, finally the last couple of points which are also of equal importance one is uh, uh, a very busy customer who is not available most of the times and how 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 do we um, how do we embrace change all the time? So these are some of the practical challenges that you know, teams have uh, you know, faced. And even, you know, um, I mean, uh, even the experienced practitioners, right? Once in a while, they kind of find it difficult to uh, know how to come out of it. Yeah, I think one of, one of the challenges I definitely see, I think synergy in that is the interruptions and the distractions. So which would lead to, you know, making it hard to pin down the time box, because if you're, if you're running, um, you know, I, I often find that I'll use a mix within um, the teams that I'm working with because they can't run a fixed sprint. They can't fix their work for two weeks because something will come in that's urgent and important that they've got to work to. And if they run kind of Kanban where, you know, it's the next most important urgent thing, then some things never get to the top of the list. So that there's this kind of mix needed often and and um the way the way i always do it is through an inbox so you know actually you know there's an inbox that slack is available within the sprint which is there potentially for you know scope creep but also you know say so where things take longer than we think they're gonna take in that sense rather than the customer changing their mind but also to to deal with those distractions and have a bit of a control point for them so that we're not just getting kind of clients drop bomb in saying, you know, send us random emails saying, um, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? A, a lot of teams I work with, they, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, the customer, they're so chaotic, you know, and they're really busy, like you say, and so pinning them down or they'll just ping stuff to us ad hoc. 
And I always say, well, you've got a really badly trained customer. You know, actually, you know, if you were running the sprint pattern with your client and they knew that they were going to speak to you every two weeks or three weeks, then you would teach them to save those things up and only contact you in an emergency when it is urgent, important. So actually we can, we, you know, it's as important to be using this with, you know, the partners, with the customers, as it is internally as a team to, to overcome some of the challenges that, that teams face, you know, because these aren't necessarily challenges faced by Agile, they're challenges faced by, you know, things constantly changing and uncertainty and clients evolving their ideas, you know, especially if you're building something huge. Um, you know, by the time you get halfway through it, the, the, the market's going to change, the product will have changed. So, you know, we, we need to have that adaptive approach and, and it, it, it be really embedded. Sorry, I went right on. A... <laughs> uh, so there's a couple. Does it does anybody want to put forward um, um, any um, challenges, particularly that they've got that um, I, I put the boat up here because I love this exercise in terms of identifying you know if you imagine that your 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 team you're on this boat this you're this representing your project or your business or your team you know and there are those things that are putting the wind in your sails but then there are those anchors that are holding you back um and i think you know prioritization is another big one that's often i think people say you know it's hard to prioritize and plan mm -hmm. right right I have a question uh, if I can go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, basically, um, uh, this, this point is of some interest to me. So when you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I have a client, uh, a customer who is pretty resistive, one thing, and second is uh, unavailable because he the, the customer himself is so busy and he's, uh, he's a sponsor and he pays money, uh, all that he is interested in is delivery uh, on time. Okay. Now, when we are uh, being told to deliver uh, in this uh, agile uh, model and the customer not being uh, available for us, uh, you know, in terms of uh, clarification and stuff like that. So, what is the best way to deal with such a resistive customer? Or maybe, you know, person who is so busy you know we have to strike a balance we have to uh, you know make him uh, satisfied or happy as well as um we should not get you know bombarded or impacted so what what's the best approach i think if you can put in place a bit of a rhythm and going back to what i was saying there really is have a sprint rhythm that says you know and it might not be that you're you know going back to him every week i don't know the size and the scale of the project and things but you know, if you can put in that, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to meet every three weeks, we'll show you what the progress is, we'll get your feedback. Um, whether that it might be that somebody else is actually better to sit in that, because he's almost, you're talking about a product owner role almost, are you, in that sense of getting feedback from him, getting guidance yeah. on which direction. Um, yeah. so I think it's difficult and it, it's it's I, I I smile because um I taught agile for a few years and I used to ask the students to come up with you know what are the downfalls of agile um and mm. one of them is is clients are often not very agile it's very you know sometimes they do just want to say I don't want to be involved just go right. away yeah. do it and bring it back yeah. when it's done you know and they don't really understand that they need to be involved so I think there's there's groundwork that we need to lay with them to get them engaged but again I think those visualizations make it really quick and easy to be able to update the client show them the working solution you know give that that quick feedback that you know and maybe through channels where you know if he's too difficult to pin down that you can send him things or you can you know engage in other ways through different channels because if he's not available for a phone call then um you know it, it's looking for those alternative ways to engage yeah okay yeah thanks thanks for that yeah you is there anything you want to add see maybe what happened 
see mainly i i would probably think i mean what you say is right uh we are still you know struggling in one of the projects where in uh, see as you mentioned we can always have uh, we do have a two biweekly connect with him in terms of uh, uh you know uh, reporting the progress and what's happening and stuff like that i mean this is apart from all the sprint review meeting and all that that that's all very normal now this is a completely different connect wherein we discuss uh, you know certain things which are more to do with the risks with what's happening in the team how things are what is the health um, and all that you know uh, the, the motivation of the team and all that so there generally what happens is uh, at times we get to cancel the call even even if it's once in two weeks yeah, he, yeah, yeah. See, i respect the fact that he is a very busy person i don't yeah. i don't have that thing but but you know it becomes uh, there is always a limit uh, it's not that he is not available for 6 weeks 8 weeks suddenly he shows up and says what's happening you know this is a very common problem uh, we can't even tell him anything because he is the sponsor so he is the one who pays who pays the money so he is the big boss right so that's that's something which i just want to understand yeah it is difficult it's so um, you you remind me of a team that i worked with um a little while ago and they were finding it really challenging to get engagement from they they basically needed the client to provide content and they were really yeah. you know finding it a challenge to get that and we just had this huge conversation about actually is this process working for them you know okay. is this working for them if it's not how can we change it to make it work for them um and trying to see it from that different perspective you know rather than it's not working for us actually why isn't it working for them because they should be engaged shouldn't they they should be you know excited and engaged and you know it's it's kind of like oh you know you feel like you're a bit like when i said about putting video on you feel like you're talking to somebody then um yeah. so i think that would be the question that i would kind of poise would be that you know what can we do to make it work better for them um and work better for us as well and manage that so sometimes we have to accept it and go right okay we're not going to see him for eight weeks and then he's going to come in yeah. with umpteen requests and things so we need exactly. to be prepared for that we need to manage that and we need to be able to visualize it and put that right on the wall for him to show or her sorry i keep saying him um but you know to show them like this is what's the impact because i think you know you can tell somebody so many times and they just don't hear it but if you put it on the wall literally you know you, you can yeah. visualize it some way then that really i think helps to to show them and then they you know will work it out for themselves yeah. you know it's uh, right. especially when right. you're dealing with somebody in power in that sense i think as well in that sense of you know we don't feel you know like we should be able, we don't feel like challenging this but you know you do need to challenge it but not in a you know in it but in a positive way which you yeah. you you know move you forward rather than in a destructive way which is just criticizing and saying it's all wrong actually how can we make this better and running something yeah. like the boat would be a great exercise actually you know what's going well <laughs> what are the anchors holding you back so you know this isn't just for retrospectives of our sprint this is we can use this for get feedback and reflections from our clients yeah. as well i'm going to stop myself there and um <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, right. so i think the only thing that i would probably like to add is because i think you have uh, um, you have presented it beautifully a good discussion all right uh, i i think it, uh, in such a situation it is time to you know have a candid uh, but a firm chat with the customer so that you no know, he you can um, can enlighten him on you know what what is it that you are trying to do uh, right in terms of uh, i know it's not uh, i mean it's easier said than done but but once he un understands the, the whole aspect of it and he understands that he is equally Uh, responsible for uh, this successful engagement i think uh, uh, you we, we should probably be able to see you know um, a slow change uh, no um, in two direction yeah chill on this such side piyush i would like to add see this kind of uh, problem i have seen many times when uh, uh, the sponsor or the the key stakeholders right when they they don't 
like they are not in, in, interested suddenly they will come so normally what i do in in my projects okay so what i will do i will set up a demo call i will give them a demo and like this one is getting recorded i will ask them to record and will show what we have done and the before the end of the sprint we'll have a one week of feedback uh, feedback where they can give a feedback and we, we will tell how much percentage we can we, we can include with emission and we'll give a justification also what cannot be achieved and if it is a priority it has to be taken into next sprint so there and before when we send the invite for demo we also make sure we send the repeated reminders we also ensure other important stakeholders along with the product owner also knows the importance of the meeting and they deal also right mm -hmm. so you have to bring everybody on the same page to avoid this kind of scenario right, and right. i like that yeah. yeah i think yeah, yeah i think reminding ourselves that we're all on the same side is yeah. definitely a really good and remembering that reminding ourselves that we're all on the same side so that is uh, yeah yeah can be just that mindset that you're going into it i think yeah. is yeah brilliant that's uh, right let's have a look at the um the uh next thanks, thanks so um question thank you i think we'll um well if we don't get through all the questions i don't think that's a bad thing necessarily but i am mindful people are on the call that have got their questions so i want to make sure <laughs> we're good but that's Great. brilliant that's um Great. So getting people um, to work together is the next one. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, getting all the associates uh, to work as a team, not as individuals, right? Uh, especially in terms of aspects of individual ownership versus uh, team ownership in agile delivery. I think this, this question kind of uh, stems uh, you know, from the traditional ways of doing things where uh, there's enough time at disposal and then there are bigger teams so necessarily associates don't end up discussing with each other or there are there is quite a bit of hierarchy in the team where you have you know um, technical leads or project managers who do most of the you know um, team building or most of the exercises that need the, you know, um, that need some collective leadership right so so when when teams um, are uh, suddenly exposed to agile ways of doing things. Um, I think that is a challenge that uh, people you know, often face, right? Um, so, so that's that's the question, uh, Belinda. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I I I pop that photo in. Um, if you got a quick chance, I've come back onto video because I I forgot to turn it back off again. <laughs> so, um, so I try and remember to pop back. Um, it's um, but yeah, I think. Again, you know, and, and building on the previous question is getting everybody working together is having that high level view. So um, that photo is actually a, a museum team, so not a technical team at all, but they have um, they have the team, they have volunteers, they have partners, they have collaborators, they have stakeholders, they're running multiple projects, multiple exhibitions. Um, and actually that that exercise was us all really getting together to map out this roadmap and to give us this and it it wasn't necessarily the result of the roadmap but actually the process of them all getting together and filling that roadmap out so it was more that process that you're going through rather than the end result the end result of having that roadmap was great but actually getting them you know engaged and feeling like they're all on the same team um, so I think there's some great activities that we can do that that really help to, um, you know, build those relationships, build that rapport, get that collaboration, get that conversation going so that people do feel like part of the team. You know, we we again, I, I mean, I run um, I, I set up an organization called Software Cornwall, which was all about helping kids into tech careers. Um, and again, that was all volunteers and, you know, it's almost like open source community, you know, building a community and, um, you know, and, and it is about, you know, that collaboration and getting people um, working together. And I think now that we're so much more remote and we're doing a lot of working from home, actually, the collaboration and the communication is so much more important. And, you know, we need and again, Agile works is this beautiful channel that really helps us to visualize things, represent things, share things, show people what's going on. 
and then help to break down those barriers and really get people included and and finding those common interests i i work with a um an r d tech team um uh well it's a couple of years ago now but they all one of the things they said to me when i first worked with them was that they were like yeah we're an agile team but we all do different jobs um and uh, we time record on jira um and that was you know the kind of you know they had a they had a, a scrum master who would allocate the work and you know they were they were kind of using the agile tools but they weren't really being agile and um that was why they wanted me to work with them and look at ways that they could be agile and actually we found some real common ground across skills and learning collaboration shared partners all these different things that yeah okay they were working on different things but there was synergy and that's where we found the glue if you like to to really get them together and start working more cohesively as a team right so uh, does that um hopefully that's a is that a good answer <laughs> so, right. but it is about relationship and rapport and trust i think as well and bringing people in and and acknowledging that some people do like to work independently as well and letting that and and accepting that and then looking for the ways where we can collaborate and work together so so again getting that balance really that's, uh, and, I, and i think um, um, i mean for um for every person, right? Um, I mean, as the team uh, comes together, um, um, I think it, it makes sense to identify a specific comfort zones and then um, creating the transparency or awareness that uh, no, those comfort zones are also inclusive you know, as part of the team. And that is when you will see that the, uh, the team members see the inclusiveness or they start feeling that they belong to the team. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and and once uh, you know, uh, the teams, um, uh, once there is team bonding, right? Um, uh, in terms of whatever accountabilities or ownership uh, that is there, I think it will it will all, as you said, right? The glue. Uh, uh, I mean, because it might not be the same for every team, but once you find that glue, right? You just have to make sure that it is there, and then it it holds the team together. Mm -hmm. And I think remembering as well that, again, going back to the last question as well, I think is that. You know if you're working with associates that are you know also you know they're not just working full time on your project they've got other projects so i think it's sometimes you can get it's easy to forget that it's because you're spending 100 percent of your time all your focus is on that project then you know you you kind of have that expectation that everybody else is as well so i think sometimes we have to be mindful that that actually they're probably juggling a few different things they're not working full time and so they're not got um the same flexibility and same as customers you know they're not spending all their time on this project they they've got to fit it in and again coming back to that does it work for them That's, uh, yeah cool just to add uh, a point there, uh, since we spoke about ownership, right? So what I, I mean, possibly um, uh, an important point. I wouldn't say it's an advice, but a suggestion for uh, you know um, uh, for, for the audience in this uh, um, in this room. Um, maybe when they get an opportunity, they can try it out. Uh, the, the point is, um, sometimes, right? Uh, despite uh, all that we try in terms of uh, you know, uh, making the team. Uh, be accountable or try to inculcate that sense of ownership in them. Um, uh, we would have tried the you know, all the normal normal routes or the uh, usual um, ways of doing things. And if it doesn't work, right? So um, what 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 I uh, what I learned from one of the leading practitioners in the industry is uh, it's a concept called leading from behind, right? So, um, and at some point you realize that uh, no, uh, you you just uh, no, uh, make them aware of their responsibilities, and then you don't uh, um, you are in you are no more in charge. You I mean you still you still uh, lead, but you don't give uh, you know, that inclination or indication, and you are leading them from behind. And that is when we see that wonderful things happen. I mean, at least I have seen that in certain cases in my projects. So it might not work all the time, but with, with a good team, right? You will see that uh, with the right potential, they will start owning up things. And then you, know, um, you will see that things fall in place uh, much better than how hard anyone else would have tried. Yeah, yeah. I think that the, 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 this is a challenge as well. This, this, you know, getting people, you know, I, it actually reminds me of a later question around, you know, getting people to allocate their own work versus allocating it for them. 
I mean, that's a big thing about people taking ownership, but also taking ownership as a team so that, you know, if if we've got, we've got to be careful about individual targets because it, it creates competition and we want to create collaboration. So we want to kind of say, this is the team's goal and how do we collaborate as a team? So if one person is challenged and finding it hard, that actually this, the team get together to help them you know they don't stand back and say well that's you know it's their fault that we didn't deliver at the end of the sprint you know we need to create that 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 vibe within the team that actually we're all in it together um again we're all on that 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 same side right cool right. i think it leads quite nicely um into yeah one of the other um one of the other questions um oh hang on i think i've um where's the change one Oh, I feel like we're missing a question. We might have to come back to it. Uh, one where, where we deal with resistance to change. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah. I think it is here somewhere. But um, I'll have a look in a second because uh, otherwise I'll give you all... Uh, hang on, let me stop sharing. And uh, But, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure the next question should be... It might be I cut down my deck very quickly before um, we started. Okay. Before we started, and I'm a bit worried that I've um, got rid of uh, that. Oh no, it's just further down in the. Um, there we go. Let's let me bring that back up and uh, replay that. There we go. That's, uh, that'll teach me to um, to with slides just before you start a presentation doesn't it it's, uh, <laughs> but there we go so uh yeah so this how to deal with resistance to change within a team that's uh, so, um and i couldn't resist putting the um the adoption life cycle up there um it's uh just Oh, I mean, my, I'm going to try and do a really quick, succinct um, answer actually, because we're running. Um, we're 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 talk I'm talking way more than I should be. Um, but um, how to deal with resistance, change and see. But the, the the one thing I think, you know, is if you're getting resistance to change in your team, then it's not necessarily a bad thing because that person is speaking out, and the fact that they care is a really great thing, you know. So if they care enough to challenge it then one, that means that they feel safe to challenge it and also that they care enough. So listen to them, you know, is listen to their their their, their concerns, um, you know, and um, talk it through because actually one, some of them might be valid um, and, you know, and also it, it helps them to address those, those questions and those challenges that they've got and, and recognising that, um, you know, I, I love the, product adoption life cycle and I just think it rings true in so many different things that you know if, if you say we're introducing agile to this organization there's gonna be the early adopters and the innovators that are jumping on that and you know yeah we want to do something new we want to change do something different yeah but there are also those people later on who want to see that it's working before they're willing to to to, to test it and that that is a natural evolution through the organization, which is why we say you can't big bang agile because it needs to grow organically within a, in an organization. And, you know, some people within the organization will want to sit back and observe and see how it pans out um, rather than get jumped straight in, you know, at, at the earliest opportunity. So I think we need to be mindful of that and let you know that that journey of change happen within the team and let people do that in time i don't think if we force it across then you know you will get that hard resistance so and and ideally we want to get our teams into a place where they're actually pulling that change we're not pushing it on them right have you got anything to add um yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, once we identify the innovators and the early adopters, right, and then we um, we make them uh, uh, a part of uh, uh, the whole exercise or the engagement, uh, I think that energy will uh, trickle down or it will 
I mean, they will rub it off on the others, right? So uh, the early majority and the late majority will also you know, find it safe to um, get onto the bandwagon, right? And then uh, going by the uh, principle of inclusivity, I think the laggards uh, also, we take them along because uh, I mean, that's how uh, the spirit of team is, uh, right? So that's that's what I would like to add. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think it's, it is that 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 recognition. So this was a, um, a um, oh gosh, I did, oh, I left this slide, I left this one on. We were talking about this last night. I was trying to describe it to you. And I this is my doodle that I did last night after our call. So I put it in there and I, I, um, I'm glad I left it in actually. It's, um, but this, 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 um, but yeah, these practical difficulties in, in adopting Agile in big projects. And I think we've, we've almost covered that in our last couple of sentences in that sense of, um, you know, not being able to big bang agile into an organization. Yes, uh... shall, I, shall I read out the question? Yes, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so far we were discussing about the first topic. So, it's time now to get on to the next one. So, this is about the uh, uh, um, concept of scaling or uh, the need for scaling uh, in agile delivery, right? Um, so, <laughs> just one big question. Um, uh, this is the idea is to discuss the practical difficulties in adopting uh, agile delivery in larger projects uh, that deliver features over a longer period of time and require a larger number of people or you know, quite a few teams uh, to be around. And um, um, another uh, additional question along with that, um, um, speci uh, specifically on Spotify, right? So does the famous Spotify model work well or are there better ways of uh, doing it? Yeah, I um, we we again we we briefly spoke about this yesterday, and um, I I have this kind of quite strong feeling about the Spotify model in that I think it's absolutely brilliant. I I, I really do love the Spotify model. I've I've, I've spoken to some of the Spotify um, uh, crew who you know who, who work, and I think it's great. But the Spotify model is Spotify's model. It works for their business model. Um, and, um, you know, and while there are definitely things that you can take from it and apply, it's the essence and the sentiment that you really want to be taking. You can't, you know, if you just replicate it, it's not going to work. And what they've done beautifully is they have built their own style and flavor of agility. They've taken, you know, the different methods and tools, the learning across lean and agile. They've got a, such a strong culture and and a mindset around you know building something together that it works really really well and I think that's the kind of key behind the Spotify model and doing it at scale and they don't do things at scale they do lots of little things that then all beautifully you know kind of um and work together so um it, they, they don't have one big model I don't think they have lots of little models that then form this 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 Spotify model which is great so it's um yeah it, it is about I, I and, and being agile is all about that and that you know and that model is continuously improving and changing you know if you go to a talk from spot if you watch a talk from spotify a couple of years ago and now look at another one it will be slightly different because there are new versions it's always evolving and adapting and growing with the business and with the model so as things change it changes too um, and i think that's one of the things that we try to do too much is pin things down we try and go right that's it it's fixed now we've done it whereas actually it is and and the road less traveled the book is all about that is actually you know our map is constantly changing and in order to you know live that road less traveled if you like is that we need to accept that map changes and embrace that so that's it. sorry that's a slightly deeper meaningful reply but um i've uh... <laughs> I think uh, uh, this question was asked by uh, Sayed. He is on the call. Uh, so Sayed, ah. uh, it's Sayed specifically um, in terms of the practical difficulties, right? Uh, that uh, larger team space. Uh, uh, a few points that came to my mind uh, would be, you know, um, I mean, if the if the solution or the product in question is uh, um, is being uh, um, designed or devised as a set of components, right? So intercomponent delivery agreements. 
is is going to always going to be a challenge and then uh, uh, bigger uh, the engagement more the number of teams how do we deal with time boxing you know, even what kind of sprints are we looking at and how do you go about uh, doing your sprint reviews or any other reviews for that matter uh, what should be the you know what should be the agreement of having uh, um, uh, said that we are ready or we are done right i mean technically that definition of ready or definition of done in the scrum uh, language and then uh, how how how, do, how um, what kind of backlogs should we be looking at and and how about uh, you know, um, bigger plans so i think these are some of the practical uh, difficulties right and uh, uh, but the key to i mean i would say i mean as highlighted by belinda right the key to remember here is uh, irrespective of which uh, scaled um, model you take the idea should be you know, because most of the agile delivery frameworks are you know, lightweight frameworks um, i mean i at least i would expect the scale delivery um, uh, scaled agile delivery framework also to be you know, um, to retain that lightweight nature uh, right and then and we, we 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 don't scale because it is larger we don't scale because it is uh, um, we we want to we we I mean we scale only if it is necessary right and then every now and then we try to descale you know as applicable right so so from that perspective just to conclude right spotify try and understand what the model is see what elements work for you if you feel that the model in its entirety uh, no, does well then see if it uh, no, um, fits well to your business model uh, because uh, even the practitioners at spotify have uh, no, um, have given a spoiler saying that uh, uh, this is something that we have, has evolved at spotify over a period of time and what we were doing in 2012 is not necessarily what we are doing now so if we take something which they are not using at the moment um, i'm not sure how much sensible would that be you know for somebody to adopt that in 2022 right without uh, um, really making sure that it, it um, we understand what it is and we understand their business model and we compare it with ours and then we make sure that it you know it, it fits well right I think it's like um, not using a um, the, not overdoing things either. You know, if there are challenges, let's look at into that area and deal with those challenges where they are, rather than trying to kind of um, you know you see that a lot as well. We're implementing this thing to everyone, whereas actually it's not needed everywhere by everyone. That actually it's um you know we can deal with the smaller challenges quickly and i think that's again one of the lovely things about agile is it brings these things to our attention fast and if we're listening then we can deal with them before they even really become a major problem right yeah chetan is one question see when you are in the service industry you don't have a luxury of saying like you're not going to scale up the agile delivery because it's up to the sponsor and your the scope right which you have to do it the ideal way could be like you create a scrum or scrum you have a multiple scrum teams and fix the sprint for them and you schedule or one uh, schedule a milestone delivery where you need an integration between these all these sprints that's the way it works in a larger team for example you went for more than eight member teams this has to be done like a product development company you can come with your own Agile model, and you can demonstrate to the stakeholder. But in the service industry, you don't have a luxury. Sorry. Right. I think uh, that's a valid, fair point, uh, Piyush. I mean, I, I see in terms of you see, at the, end, the customer is bothered, or he is just interested in you know what kind of business value you deliver to him, right? So, or, or, I mean, obviously, he might have a say in that regard, saying that you. No, um, uh, have a bigger team and deliver more features and all that. But but again, as you said, right? Uh, 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 what works for you uh, might not work for me, or what works for me might yeah, not work. Yeah. For you, right. So if you have found that uh, some of these practices that come from safe, right, like the Scrum of Scrum, or even you know, having bigger teams and then um, having an integration layer, uh, as long as you, you know, don't compromise, or as long as the teams don't compromise on the underlying you know, uh, basic values of the Uh, the base agile delivery framework right and as long as you are able to uh, match steps with the uh, all the teams put together and as long as there is um, a releasable increment you know that is ready once every few weeks um, i think your your job is uh, uh, done in that way i would say right? true 
brilliant, brilliant. Let's have a look. I'll um, pop the um, my um, oh my my diagram just to just to kind of say it to everybody. So I was talking about this kind of like we're not implementing this big agile right the way across the organisation is actually there's lots of little agiles going on that then kind of create this more dynamic and I was trying to put it in a picture I haven't done a very good job but um I don't know if it, it comes across that the kind of sense of actually little pockets of agility that are growing and 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 lots of smaller teams so you know we that's the point of agile is lots of small steps so think big act small um, and when we're scaling something, it's the same thing, whether we're scaling a business, a product, a service, you know, think big, act small. We can think about that life cycle again. You know, yes, that's where we want to be, but actually that's not where we are today. Where are we today and how are we going to grow and develop this so that we can equally, you know, right size as well. So there's this talking about scaling and descaling I'm more kind of right sizing you know actually we need to right size things that fit the organization the model the work the industry that they're in so um, cool. yeah that's brilliant that's great um, I'm going to flip over these because we're um we're running um we're running quite behind um so I think um I mean I'm happy to carry on are you um if obviously those of you guys watching you can nip out and grab a drink or a comfort break if you want to as well but i'm i'm quite happy to carry on and we'll canter through so we these questions yeah i have the question sorry um, oh yeah go on sorry yeah uh can you go to the previous slide uh, uh the one which who had um the big a, the, my, my, my big a and the little yeah. a that one. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. Don't take it too literally. <laughs> that was literally a doodle last night. <laughs> okay. Okay. See here, uh, my questions. We have asked this question earlier also um, to somebody else. See, we have something called as um, communication channels, if you know. Now that's a concept. That is, I mean, that's a general concept. It's a PMP concept. Okay, so when we have a team and when just we have a, let's say we have a team of six people and if just one person gets added, the number of communication channels actually goes two folds just by adding one person into the team. Now, my point here is in terms of this diagram, uh, when I look at the hierarchical structure versus agile structure, wherein uh, you, it's more transparent if I understand it right, wherein, you know, the the there is no hierarchy. I mean, basically, it's not that I cannot talk to the product manager uh, or, you know, that there is a layer between and all that. Don't you think this actually causes a lot of confusion when I actually create a mesh kind of a communication um, model? Because that's what happens, you know, the moment I see, I mean, practically I'm talking, what happens is more stakeholders we have into the project, more confusion it leads to. I mean, you're handling the confusion as a different matter. Okay, but there is always a lot of views, a lot of people coming in and uh, things never end, you know, discussions never end. Everybody will have their own view. So what, what is your take on this uh, hierarchy versus, you know, the other, other uh, kind of model? So you, uh, you, you've just made me realise one of the things I'd love to do is put this, the, the, the over word in there, switch those around and kind of go, because I think we can't get away from hierarchy. We do have hierarchy within organisations, but it's it's more of an HR diagram than it is yeah. the way we actually work. Um, you know, most businesses I work with, independent of whatever type of business, they all work cross-functionally. But the you know it, the the picture is the hierarchy. So mm -hmm. um, and I agree. You know the more people you add, the the more complex the the communications get. Which is again where I think we have to come back to going. Actually, you need small things that are talking to each other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, closely related, <clears throat> rather than one person trying to oversee everything, because you know it's just impossible and this is where you know we're trying to get to that self-organizing self-managing 
because actually mm. then the business runs itself like the planet sustains itself you know we're kind of looking for that infinite game aren't we where you know we want to keep playing the game and it's yeah it's it's about creating that that feeling and it is harder I, I again I have this conversation so many times agile is not the quick simple easy way to do things it's mm. not it's the it's the the way that we do that we're trying to get most value and we're getting you know viable working solutions you know like the minimum viable product it's not cheapest yeah. quickest thing we can throw out the door it's about developing a viable product and people often <laughs> miss the viable word you know so you know this isn't easy it isn't straightforward it is dynamic it is ever-changing and moving and that's why the people component is so important because we're not machines you can't fix this in sprints and you know measure our productivity because it bounces up and down you know so yeah we it's that acceptance of that I'm going to stop myself because I'm really getting carried away with that one <laughs> yeah okay right. I think I think just to summarize um, it's like uh, we we said that it's going to be exciting no one said it's going to be easy right because here the pros uh, the pros of this approach kind of outweigh the cons right and i think we 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 try and live with the cons we deal with it rather than you know, being in a hierarchical structure and then not having any kind of transparency or visibility yeah it's basically i i would feel it's more about balancing balancing this versus that right and that's uh, the word yes and going with both the uh, approaches yeah no it's good it's good stuff isn't it that was uh... yeah. Brilliant. Right, slide flip. Um, those slides that I'm flipping past, if you are one of, if you're like me and that makes you go, oh, I want to see those slides, um, then go on my YouTube channel because both of the exercises are on there. It's the cup of tea and the uh, mindset test. So if you if you want to go and play those exercises, um, then you can do go go on the YouTube channel. So um, they're they're great little exercises, and I'm really hoping we'd have some extra. But we've we've eaten all our slack already, so we're um, into our one minute kind of replies on our questions. Um, so yeah, shall we? Um, do you do you want to give your first? Um... Thanks, Belinda. So uh, I think so far we had two topics, uh, broad topics, uh, based on the kind of uh, um, um, intensity that uh, most uh, people um, from the audience uh, you know, uh, wanted to know. Uh, now, this is the less, um, these are some more questions that we received, and we are quickly going to run through them. The first one, right, um, <clears throat> a good fit uh, Scrum Master's role, right? Who can perform a better Scrum Master role? an experienced project manager or would it be a program manager or is it going to be a technical lead you know, can someone who is uh, um, um, who is a fresh graduate um, uh, out of college or you know, a, a pmo or a facilitator who understands uh, the software development life cycle model well perform this role um, so this has been discussed on quite a few platforms but i think for most of them it still remains a little blurred um, so um, that is the that is what uh, I think the I mean it is one of the questions and just to before I hand it over to you Belinda quickly to add my thoughts right definitely see, for me from my perspective Scrum Master is um, is a kind of leadership role right so I would put that equivalent to a traditional project manager or even you know, at times a senior project manager or or in that uh, um, or in that role right a technical architect or even a product manager. All right. So, I mean, it's definitely not uh, uh, no, um, um, not a role that can be performed overnight, right? I have been doing something yesterday and today suddenly you know, they announced that I am a scrum master. For, at least for me, it doesn't work that way, right? So, your thoughts, um, Belinda? Hmm. I um so I should pre pre with them so I'm I'm not particularly a a scrum advocate or a safe advocate or anything so um and and um so I often talk about a sprint facilitator and I think it's a similar role to the scrum master but it's not exactly I'm not I'm not talking from a scrum position in, just to make that that say that out front um 
I do think somebody who's got great facilitation skills makes a great scrum master. Um, and I think somebody who is able to disconnect themselves from the content. So I'm not saying that they're not involved in the content. They might be, but I think it's a different hat. So I think when you're 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 putting on the hat of the sprint facilitator, you're actually moving into a bit of a servant leadership role. I'm here to serve the team. I'm not here to make the decisions. The, the team are here to decide the content. I'm here to hold the process and help facilitate that, you know, and 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 help the team to, to work it out for themselves, you know. So I do think it's a real kind of coaching facilitator type role. Um, I think sometimes, you know, somebody fresh out of college, um, somebody who has no knowledge of the content is actually a great facilitator because they're completely independent then from the content. So I think you can see it both ways. Sometimes it's great to have somebody that does know it. And sometimes actually it's good to have somebody who doesn't. Um, and it is about hats. So I I, I agree. Um, I, something you said earlier about people changing roles is actually, you know, I'll often when I'm I'm coaching and advising and training as I'll say, look, I'm, I'm taking off my hat here and I'm putting on my advisor hat. You know, I'm going to tell you now I'm not going to coach you. I'm going to tell you and I make that active distinction to them. So I think, you know, um, yeah, I think, you know, that's what we're looking for in a scrum master. I don't think it really, you know, that that um, that um, we can say it's any one person and particular experience and background. Um, so yeah, and somebody to facilitate, isn't it? It's somebody who will take those facilitation reins, I think, a lot of the time. I, oh, the traffic lights and the roundabout is um, a bit of a servant leadership thing. Um, so the uh, traffic lights, you know, am I being a traffic light kind of leader or am I being a roundabout leader? So a traffic light is a very command and control. I'm telling you when to go. I'm telling you what to do. I'm telling you when to stop. Whereas a roundabout is more I'm putting in place these rules and guidelines to help you to navigate this for yourself. Yeah. So actually, we want to be more roundabout if we're going to be, you know, we're, we're as a scrum master, we want to be a roundabout that's helping facilitate that team to navigate them things themselves rather than traffic light telling them, you know, when to stop and go. Does that make sense? Um, right. Next question. Let's go. How to. Oh, I love this one. I love this one. Um, <laughs> this is about uh, how to make. Um, how to make an introvert uh, talk and I think there is a related question along with that uh, making uh, all of them speak freely in meetings the biggest the, 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 the bit of advice I was given once by somebody um, was um, to be quiet um, and I, it's such a powerful one um, it's almost like uncomfortable silence you know you you I will fill a space I will fill a silence and teaching myself not to so actually shutting up so other people can talk so one of those things because I am you know a talkative person one of the reasons I'm letting you take them go fast is so that you get your words <laughs> you know so actually being quite but there, there is just this this sentiment of you know creating this comfortable space for people this safe space for people but also you know recognizing that you know if if you have got an introvert in the team you're not going to make them talk you've got to create a space that allows them to talk and you know asking them for a, 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 a an answer off the cuff is you know you're not going to get one you need to give them time to reflect and review so one thing I would say is you know ask them about the last meeting not about straight now let them play that observer role you know and then feedback at the end of the session you know let them be comfortable being the person that they are don't try and force them to be an extrovert when they're you know if they don't want to be and then I think you start to see people you know coming out of their shell and 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 contributing more um and and that links into that you know ensuring the team uh, are you know taking ownership and picking their stories again going back i mean that that really should have the traffic lights and the roundabout again is you know if 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 the scrum master or the PO is assigning them, then they're being traffic lights and not being roundabouts and they're not being a scrum master or a product owner either. They're being a command and control micromanagement 
you know, telling people what to do. So, you know, the problem isn't the team there. The problem is the micro, the, you know, you know, stop telling them what to do, be quiet, and you might find that they will. Right, right. I agree. Is there anything else you want to um, add? Um, I mean, I think pretty much you have uh, summarized. Just <laughs> I, I think uh, you know uh, the very strong point is allowing them to play to their strengths, and then uh, you know, um, um, so that they they don't feel that their comfort zone is taken away from them. Right? I think that is that that is the highlight, and then I think eventually they will come out of their shell, and things should fall in place. Yeah, yeah, but I think. If we force, you know, people and, and everybody has their extrovert, introvert side. Right now I'm in extrovert mode, but three hours ago I was riding my horse and I was in my introvert mode. I was in my shell. I was clearing my mind, ready for this session. Um, and so, you know, it's about creating a space, you know, where people feel um, yeah, safe and comfortable. And and I just love this little gif, which was, you know, uh, when we started with lockdown, you know, everybody felt a bit, you know, we're all waving and that becomes, it's such a natural and normal thing to do. So actually, you know, that, 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 that repetition and that iteration helps as well. Right, let's, uh, oh, DevOps and Agile be made to work seamlessly in teams adopted both. Have you, do you want to go for this one? Um, right. So how the yeah how can DevOps and Agile be made to work seamlessly in teams that have uh, adopted the both? Right. Um, so again, uh, uh, I think because in um, in an earnest attempt or in an anxiety to do uh, too many things at once, I think that is where uh, you know um, uh, I mean um, what what we call I mean or what you address as shiny objects. Right. That's what happens. Uh, I think I think in most organizations or or the kind of push you know, that comes their way um, with the high energy levels in the beginning. And then uh, you will start seeing things fade away, right? So uh, I, I would say uh, no, start minimal, right? Start minimal, know where to start in the sense, have a cross-functional team with uh, you know, a good set of for T-shaped skills. And then um, uh, have this in mind saying that uh, um, is the starting point and then continuous improvement is what no happens along the way and then you uh, i mean it's like there is they say right when when you eat an elephant uh, you eat it one bite at a time or one piece at a time right so do you know uh, you know uh, play to your strengths and then have continuous improvement in mind and i think um, uh, on one side you will because these are the two walls of silos that we are trying to break right i mean one wall between the customer and the uh, delivery team, that is uh, via via our agile delivery practice, and then the other is between um, the IT delivery and IT operations uh, 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 that wall via DevOps, right? So when when you have a mix of uh, uh, you know, practitioners doing things together, um, and and it's not like uh, you uh, start and you say that yes, today we are fully agile and we are DevOps. You start small. Now bring the uh, um, relevant practices. If you feel that you are going too fast, slow down a bit, take time, but make sure that you don't stop, right? Because um, as long as you see continuous improvement and that is what you're uh, going at, um, I think, I mean, it's not going to be easy, uh, right? Definitely, but uh, take baby steps and you should be there eventually. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it, it's that challenge for me between um, running the business you know maintaining the business and changing and growing the business isn't it it's that balance of you know one's trying to change and grow and the other's trying to maintain and sustain so we need to find that nice balance because now we're in this kind of um world of never done aren't we you know systems are never done they're constantly being maintained sustained developed evolved and and creating that kind of ecosystem where we get that balance between run and change, I think is 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 is, is really important. And um, it's um, I think it's recognizing that, and um, that really helps then the team to to kind of move forward and not be too you know like they recognize what the others trying to do. Um, 
but they are yeah I think they work well together from what I've you know I've seen I think it is often the mindset that becomes the challenge in that one's it's almost violent agreement what I call that sometimes is that because one's coming from that sustain and maintain and the other's coming from that grow and change that actually we're we're saying the same thing but we're coming from two different perspectives so if we can see that then that I think really helps to to, to build that that relationship and that rapport um and that balance so it's there um, yeah great cool right how are we doing we're not we're getting there making retros effective and interesting and addressing the points discussed in the retro um all your area, Melinda. <laughs> I um I could resist. My boat has to come up on this one because it's one of the things that I do talk about a lot, which is it's a it's a bit of a kind of challenge of mine where I see teams that run retrospectives, they say what's gone well, what could have gone better, but they don't actually make actionable steps to address those points and move things forward. They seem to just get left in the retro. So I love the boat game because, um, as I said earlier, we map our sails, we map our anchors, we scale them out of 10. And then we look for how do we raise those sails, raise those anchors just by a notch. So what can we do in the next sprint that can take that minus seven to a minus six? And then that action, those those yellow post-it notes you can see on the boat, these are those plus ones. They can go into our backlog as change and improvement tasks so when we're looking at our sprint planning and we're planning out our sprint yes we've got our planned work our delivery work but we've also got that our run the business so you know deliver the work but we've also got our change and grow stuff for the team that's saying okay during this sprint we're going to implement some of these things out of that retrospective and just making them small and actionable so uh, one team i wear this one of my favorite examples if we'll try and be quick um they put um get new so they put server minus 10 server keeps crashing um and their plus one was get new server and i was like okay that's not really a plus one is it that's probably slightly more than a plus one what's the first actionable thing that you could do in the next sprint and they were like log when the server crashes so they logged when the server crashed they logged to the time it was costing them they showed it to the director of that business and he immediately ordered a server upgrade because he saw the lost time. So those little plus ones can really get you that traction and momentum to really help that boat go faster. But yeah, so that's my my take on that one um, is that we need to use the right kind of, you know, games and tools that help the team to create this, create such a beautiful safe space, safe to challenge. You know, it's all about, you know, that it's not about people it's about the boat and, and making it go faster and it works great so um and there, there, there's a guide on my site if you want to kind of find out more right that's a very very quick overview of playing it but it's uh it's a bit of an add-on to some of the other boat exercises you might have seen Shall we um so we i'll let you have the next one there you go <laughs> So, uh, what uh, or who defines a working product in um, a large multi-vendor or a multi-feature uh, product environment developed by a set of teams or distributed teams? And a particular example is IoT kind of projects with you know, many layers. That's the question. So, um, so go on, I, you give your one minute because um, I've right. just I've just totally monopolized the last one. <laughs> So, I, I mean, from my thought perspective, just because a product is uh, um, um, slightly bigger in size or uh, um, is, is going to be a set of features um, um, bigger, um, it, it should not mean that uh, the whole, um, um, a whole lot of product managers or product owners should come into play. I mean, it, it just um, means that the product owner is uh, slightly, you know, held more accountable or you put, uh, you know, experienced product owner um, um, in place and pro and possibly in such a case uh, in such situations right he would have uh, you know, a set of business analysts or uh, you know, a smaller team uh, you know, who would then um, you know, um, be responsible for uh, individual subsystems uh, or rather uh, the overall product manager or owner would be delegating you know, some of these responsibilities uh, uh, to them 
while still being accountable for the entire product vision or the you know, overall uh, roadmap um, for, for this uh, kind of distributed engagement is, is what I would um, like to say. Yeah, I think I, um, I was on a similar vein, really, in that um, I, going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, we, we, when it's a large multi-vendor, multi-feature product, actually, we've got lots of components that need um, accepting. And, I, I, you know, my initial, actually, my, when I read this question the first time was I kind of smiled and went, the user. <laughs> and that was my shortest answer was the user you know whoever's using which bit of that and if they are using it and finding it useful then that what that's what defines you know our working solution if you like so brilliant right let's um, see if we can get through a couple more of these um oh so this one was all about estimation actually and i've got a, a fairly short um my my kind of take on estimation um to like to like do that and then you can add quickly yeah, but yeah. um I, I i kind of feel like all estimation tools can be useful um if only to generate conversation and i think the conversation is what is absolutely critical when it comes to any kind of estimation tool we're using i think one in isolation probably won't be effective i think probably we need a few um, but the reason I put this graphic up was because I think whenever we're estimating things and we're trying to measure productivity and utilization and all these different things, we need to keep reminding ourselves that we are not working down here in where we know exactly what we're doing and how we're doing things. We so often in tech, but across businesses I work with, you know, these change projects, these improvement projects, these new products, new services, new, 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 you know, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how we're going to do things. So estimating those things can be so hard. And that's why I love things like T-shirt sizes, because it really helps to give the client a gauge of things. So, you know. I, I would like this. How big is that? Right. It's an extra large. OK, it's fine. I don't need it. You know, it's an extra small. Yeah, let's go for it. So, you know, it's about driving that conversation. So we get better understanding and we do know what we're doing and how we're going to do things, if that makes sense. Sorry, I'll just finish that bit off. <laughs> Was there anything particular you wanted to add there? Take um, about a, these. Yeah, just a quick couple of points. Um, so I think how effectively is WSJF used in organizations? I think so the organizations you know, that that um, that rely on lean approaches, right, and organizations that believe in uh, working progress limits, um, I think those are the organizations would you know, uh, would possibly benefit or you know, uh, tap the full I mean full potential of WSJF. That is one. And I think again, yes, uh, t-shirt sizing um, is, is a. I mean, when you look at traditional uh, person days based estimate estimation techniques, I think definitely t-shirt sizing you know, is better placed because you can look at the sizes at a high level and then take a quick decision, right? And I think in terms of measuring uh, productivity and utilization of the team members, um, I think the traditional way of looking at uh, the delivery metrics might not work here, and we should possibly think about uh, having our own. Um, Agile delivery metrics, and which might not be you know, uh, same uh, for each organization or team, but I think that because we are not uh, really fo focused so much on productivity, right? Because it's a small team that is uh, you know, um, closely knit team, and then uh, the focus is on delivering uh, business value. And I think as long as uh, there is good business value being delivered, um, I don't think. Uh, no, uh, uh, the team themselves or anybody should really be so much concerned about uh, measuring productivity. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, just I was just going to pick up on a point that somebody made in chat that was around the um, the the weighted shortest job first oh. is, it, is about prioritization rather than estimation. So I was just going to pick up on that. So sorry, I'll, but you carry on, Emma. Yeah, no problem. See, actually, one thing which I, when I went through this, um, you know, scaled agile, there was, uh, you know, this entire WSJF part is goes a little beyond what is mentioned here. It actually goes uh, into the business value also. 
And I think there is a formula, a pretty complex formula in the table that uh, I have seen. Uh, sorry, I don't remember that. Anyway, I find it on the internet. But that actually uh, puts everything into picture. Of course, what T-shirt sizing, um, uh, the story sizing, as, as well as the business value tax. And what, what happens is not every time a simple story should be picked up first. I mean, what I'm saying is a T-shirt size vests or a uh, extra small, whatever it is, or a you know medium is picked up. Even an Excel is picked up if the business value is more higher. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Yeah. So even though we know that it's an extra large item, it takes time. The kind of business value it adds um, actually makes a difference rather than giving something uh, with a lesser value at a faster time. Yeah. So this yeah. is something I just want to add on this. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point because I was I, and I was talking about that kind of sense of as a customer, if I'm saying, oh, I'd like this thing. Is it big? Is it small? Because if it's small, I probably want to do it. But if it's extra large and going to burn half my budget, then I won't. You know, it's that kind of helping to inform and, and create those conversations that then yeah. help us to prioritize things. And, you know, uh, you know, I, uh, to me, like the way to shortest job first, you know, that kind of what's important, what's urgent, what's most valuable, you know, for us to do first, Um, you know, that that like you're saying you know size doesn't necessarily come into it then it's about delivering that business value what's most yeah. valuable and and when we talk about um minimum viable product and the pareto principle like what's right. that 20 percent of this that we can build that's going to deliver you the 80 percent of the value exactly. um that that we can get that working solution out there get you engaged get you excited about it and then look to build more and more on that Panther, did yeah. you want to add something quickly? I, I saw you pop up. Oh, no, I think it's brilliant. I think these, these slides are literally talking a lot. I think I love these slides and uh, the <laughs> picture which is getting depicted, right? I think it, it says it is so powerful. Just that, I think just going back to SAFE when we are discussing about the SAFE as such, I think why SAFE or why is Spotify? Is it because of the dependencies or is it because of the complexity of the dependencies? Is it because dependency itself it is needs to be managed? That's why we bring safe or Spotify. A kind of wide question this, but is is this is this because we need to manage these complex these dependencies? That's why that's when you bring the safe. Otherwise each and every individual team are good in managing in their own, you know, deliveries, which is a simple scrum. It's such a good point that actually, what I'm hearing you saying there is, you know, we use these methods when we need them. If things are going mm -hmm. well, you know, and then then you know we can we can we can take advantage of these methods um, and um, and and help us. Um, but we shouldn't overdo it. Is that that's what I'm kind of hearing you saying there as well? Is that we shouldn't use the methods for the sake of using the methods? We should use them when we need them, when they're most valuable to us. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I think it just uh, when, when I mean on the, your first slide, it's not sure whether you can just bring it back. But I, I like the pulse as well, where you just depicted the pulse of. Uh, there is a pulse rate, right? Which goes. Oh, up the heartbeat. Yeah, 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 yeah. The heartbeat. Yeah, I think I love that. But whether that heartbeat is always good, and people love that heartbeat as, as it, it goes up, but whether the same thing will be loved by the leadership or the management when it goes down, yeah. is a kind of question, you know. Uh, uh, if because they're where, uh, uh, you know, a leadership comes into picture and, and they should not be, um, I mean, when it goes down, the, 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 that's where the morale of the team also goes down, is it not? So, so. We, we've got to remember we're not machines. We're not factories, you know, business. It's one of the great things about Agile is it's really, you know, focused on knowledge base and people and teams and, you know, we're not machines. We don't run and, you know, like continuously. We have our ebbs and flows. 
Um, and like you say, we need to be, if we're leading a team, we need to be there for them and their highs and their lows um, and, and, and see that because um, flip yeah. back. So we're we're running slightly over, but I'm I'm um, I think we're literally on this must. Yeah, it is the last question, so we're not bad actually, considering we're we're both a chatty pair, are we? So it's um, it's uh, good. So the the sales team bringing sales in on um uh and and getting involved in estimation pre sales. What are your thoughts on that, Chatham? Um. <sighs> Right. I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, while uh, the delivery teams um, and then subsequently the operations teams, right, they got onto the bandwagon um, um, a little earlier. I think the sales teams were kind of left a little behind, right? But, but I think it is imperative or it is very essential that uh, you know, they also tune themselves to the world of agile uh, delivery. Right, so I think there is no harm in. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, uh, as part of sales and marketing, they would not have the luxury, or they would not have uh, a kind of props required to get into detailed uh, agile estimation. But I think uh, it would be good, uh, you know, uh, for them to engage with the delivery team early on, or you know, even I mean, just like how we take the concept of DevOps, uh, where the developers and the operations work together right from the beginning, rather than uh, towards. Uh, the end, right? So uh, it should make sense that uh, they also start working with the delivery team up front, and then any high level uh, high level estimates that would kind of give an indication in terms of uh, you know um, uh, as a forecast, right? Not really as a not really as a commitment written on stone, right? Which would happen in traditional uh, uh, no, uh, de delivery engagements, and any kind of um, um, uh, estimation that is done at a high level that would give them a visibility of uh, you know, what is the product why we are looking at, what is the MVP, how soon is it going to come. So I think that kind of engagement, if, if it can happen at the sales team level, then that would be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I think in the same way as we have cross-functional teams within tech, we can think of those cross-functional teams across the business. And actually, if we can be involved, so... Um, you know, I, I worked in an organization once and they had a very two very clear silos, contracts and delivery, you know, and it would literally be the contracts team would go out, win the business and throw it over the wall to delivery and it would land with us and we'd go, you've agreed we'll do what in how long, <laughs> you know, and then it's a case of us working out how we're going to deliver this in these constraints and um and it's so challenging. And if you've got that overlap, if you can create that relationship again between, um, then actually it's really good because what it means is, you know, those of us in design and development and delivery further down the pipeline, if you like, can see what's coming, but also sales and marketing can see what's happened to those contracts that they've won. And we can we can build this um, um and I work with, when I work with startups, um, one of the things they often say is, um, you know, that they've got an over-enthusiastic sales director and they'll be out there winning business and they'll come in and they'll go, guys, guys, I've won this great contract, drop everything, work on this. And you, right, okay. And then the next day they'll come in and go, guys, guys, well, I've won this, got drop everything, work on this. And you know, Agile really helps us to kind of manage that and say, okay, um, I mean, I, I was saying it, if you haven't seen the film Mary Poppins, it doesn't quite work, but um, you're not a Mary Poppins bag. And um, there's a film called Mary Poppins. She got a bag that she, she can fit anything in. She can just put all these amazing things in and out of her bag. And um, and that we're not that as a team, you know, we, we have our um, we, we have our constraints in what we can achieve. So the more we can work with sales and marketing who are, you know, at the cold face, engage with the customer, trying to understand, trying to help them to understand how we can make this client's life better. And, you know, through, through our, our solutions is, is a good thing, in my view, and getting that cross functionality throughout the organization, not just amongst tech and testing and DevOps and things, but actually much more broadly than that and I think that really helps to spread the agile as well then because you know the sales and marketing teams that I've worked with and introduced agile love it 
you know, they absolutely love it. So, you know, giving them that visibility and creating those those um, boards and, and conversations to, to create those relationships can be, yeah, I've seen brilliant, you know, really great stuff happen. In fact, I have worked with uh, this client called Startup in Singapore long back. And um, this, you know, uh, what you actually said is exactly what happened, you know. The, the pre-sales team had given a deadline uh, because they obviously need the bid uh, uh, to, I mean, they have to win the bid so that they need the, uh, you know, contract. So we ended up uh, a delivery team. I was a part of the delivery team and all that. So we ended up working night, uh, day and night to meet the, you know, uh, deadlines and all that stuff. So basically what generally happens is uh, pre-sales team, so to, to introduce agile estimates in a pre-sales cycle so that estimates can be more accurate. I would probably, my experience wise, pre-sales team are not technically sound. So they have to either um, probably approach a technical guy or um, it, it is better they don't estimate it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, a technical person's estimation is way different from a pre-sales guy estimation. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's. Oh, I I I I was building a website once. We were building a website for the Agile on the Beach conference, and um, one of the little things was I was a customer web developer working, and one of the little things was um, we had grey social media icons, and I said, you know, um how long you know can we just make those different colors you know how, how big is that from like a t-shirt perspective and he was like oh that's like three days coding and I was like they're fine gray you know they're absolutely fine gray I'm not going to waste three days of my budget changing the color of a button because it's hard coded in so I think that's the sort of insight that you guys can give sales and marketing is that okay the customer's asking for this thing is it a, an extra small t-shirt or is it an extra large t-shirt just so I can get a gauge so that I can inform the client so that shiny feature if they realize that that shiny feature that is a wouldn't it be lovelier you know is actually going to eat a quarter of their budget they may change their mind about when and whether they want that included so yeah. i think that's the real informative bit is actually you know we're not looking to recreate what the clients already got are we we're looking to make it better and bigger and better and shinier so we need that conversation in my view with sales and marketing who get what the client are looking for to be able to really understand and therefore, you know, offer a solution that's better than what they've got already. So, yeah. yeah. In fact, yeah, in fact, I think this is where the mature teams come into play, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. The, the, the way, the way pre-sales, I'm not saying that every pre-sales are like that. There are many smart people um, who are actually very good and they are in pre-sales and their accuracy levels are uh, near, you know, it, it's pretty good, the, the kind of guesswork they do. They're, they're very good in it. Some people actually don't consult uh, technical folks and they just jump into the client calls. They give some sort of uh, numbers and they don't, they, it, it completely messes up completely, you know, stuff. So uh, yeah, it depends. It, it's actually a development team or a delivery team has to be lucky to have a more uh, mature pre-sales guy working with. I think it's, um, I'm just having a quick look at the chat as well. There's some really nice little things, but going back to this as well, is I think when, you know, we're, we're trying to, ask, you know, if I put myself in a sales position, if I'm pretty clear what it is and how it's going to happen, I can estimate it. I probably don't need to get you involved. But the further away we get from knowing what we're doing and how we're going to do things, this is where sales really need your help. You know, if yeah. when I say your, I mean, you know, dev delivery, you know, the people building the solutions and designing the solutions. This is where I think they really need your help is is there because it's not clear whether it is big or small. We've just got this shiny idea that we want to see, you know, how can we do this? So, I yeah, I wholly agree. I think absolutely. Brilliant. So I'm just going to have a quick look at that. Um during um oh different people involved that's yeah interesting and um we're trying to get the small part of the delivery team involved in the project sooner in the process to help with the shaping 
and also let the shareholders yeah I think it's great to get involved early even if it's light touch to get to make that connection and make that contact and also keep sales involved after as well you know don't just see it as a blind handover but keep them involved because they're the ones that had that initial rapport and relationship with the client so you know they are your friend in terms of helping manage and get the client into a good rhythm and set their expectations on you know how often that we're going to need to talk to you and how often we're going to meet and all these things so you know giving them that visibility really helps them to be able to say you know I know the team are really busy at the moment but I'm I know that they've got some time coming up in the next few sprints we can schedule it in then so they've got some sight of what's going on so that they're not making promises because they've got more visibility of actually you know how busy you guys are um and I, I do a lot of work with teams in that in creating that visibility across the departments um so that it's not just going from you know we've won this straight into and and, and thrown over to delivery to go oh <laughs> like elsewhere brilliant uh, right um oh that's just a, a so the slides i'll share the slides after i'm gonna stop sharing there come back to video um so we are a little bit over but that was inevitable i think um and i'm glad to see so many of you still with us and i hope i kind of think well we're recording so if you ha have to drop off then at least you can grab the last 10 minutes and uh we've we've um not done badly really i think it's been a really good session i've enjoyed it have you guys enjoyed it feel free to ping your videos up and come on and, and get a word in edgeways now i shall be quiet <laughs> That is nice, pretty useful. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the session. So I hope it's given you food for thought and that Pareto, 20% of this 90 minutes will be the most valuable to you. Yeah. Cancer. Oh, thank you for the smiley faces. So thank you. So you've got to go. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for hanging on a little bit longer. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's been really nice to chat to people. Yeah, yeah. small glitch at my side. Sorry for that. I think uh, I'm mute. I'm mute. Yeah, it was it was really a good session. And uh, thanks for this session. I think we should have this session more regularly. Do you think we I should think do it again? Is, That's a good question. Yeah. Oh, I tell you what I'll do. Hang on. Let me just stop recording.